call this message the peaceful king who often disappoints. Palm Sunday. Well, if you've been brought up in church, some of you may have done have been going to church for most of your lives, others may not have been. But if you have been, then you're probably very familiar with the story of uh, Palm Sunday. You may have heard it um, many times. Sometimes we can be very <laughs> over-familiar with something. I heard how one Sunday in the Church of England, uh, a vicar was about to begin the service, and he tapped the microphone to make sure it was on. And he couldn't hear anything, even though actually it was working fine. So he leaned closer to the microphone and said, he thought he was saying to himself, there's something wrong with this thing. And the well-trained congregation immediately responded, and also with you. <laughs> sometimes something so familiar, you know, we just don't, we don't even hear it. The words wash over us. We just get... Uh, into a pattern. And I, if I'm honest, sometimes Palm Sunday can be a bit like that um, for me. But there is a lot to the events that we read about a few minutes ago. And there are four things about Jesus that I want to draw your attention to from this passage. I'll just flick on to after the reading. The first is that Jesus welcomes exuberant praise. Now Jericho is the lowest city on earth. It's over 800 feet below sea level. And Jerusalem is nearly 3,000 feet above sea level. So going from Jer Jericho to Jerusalem as Jesus and those who were with him were doing, involves a long, hard climb. The road goes through hot, dry desert all the way to the top of the Mount of Olives, at which point you have, at the same time, the first real vegetation and the first glorious sight of the city of Jerusalem below. And there would be a sense of exhilaration and relief as you reach the top. And on this occasion that we read about, add to that the sense of excitement that these Jewish pilgrims coming south from Galilee would have in anticipating the Passover festival. They were coming to the place where the living God had chosen for his name and his presence. The place where, through the regular daily sacrifices, he assured Israel of, of forgiveness, of fellowship with himself, and of hope for the future. And they were coming there to celebrate the great Jewish stories of the past, which were mostly stories of freedom and hope. They would meet with relatives and old friends. There would be singing and prayer and, and, and feasting and dancing. But it was also, as far as they were concerned, kingdom time. The time when Passover dreams, the great hope of freedom, of God's sovereign and saving presence being revealed in a new way, would at last come true. And so there's a sense in which the long climb up through the Judean wilderness was a climb to the kingdom. That's how they may well have saw, saw it. And Jesus' entry into Jerusalem marks the end of his avoiding crowds and his secrecy and the beginning of open confrontation. He very intentionally acts out the fulfillment of a prophecy, I'm doing a little wiggle for you, I'm not sure what that is, um, of Zechariah. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Zion. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
And the crowd is cheering because Jesus has just recently healed a man born blind at Jericho. And probably Jesus and his followers represent only a relatively small clutch of this big crowd. But there's this group from Bethany surrounding him. They're exultant also over the healing, the miracle of Lazarus. There are pilgrims from Galilee who knew him well, and they also formed a part of the crowd. And they praised God because of the mighty works they'd seen and which they now expected to see in Jerusalem. They thought Jesus was going to be crowned king there. And Jesus pointed out that if they stopped shouting, then even the stones would start shouting. Jesus welcomes exuberant praise. He doesn't try to stop them, even though he knows what's, what's going to happen later. The whole design of the universe is that the Lord Jesus be praised. We worship the glorious King of all kings and Lord of all lords. And I wonder if sometimes, depending on our background, we can be influenced perhaps sometimes hardly without knowing, by others to be cautious and restrained in how we express our worship. Jesus welcomes expressions of, of love and worship and praise that represent who we are. It means we give him all that we are in praising him. So Jesus welcomes that. He doesn't try to stop it in spite of what's to come. And secondly, to say that sometimes Jesus doesn't fulfill our expectations. So they were shouting, Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Common Passover greetings. Hosanna means, hooray for salvation, it's coming, it's here. Salvation, salvation. And the crowd is right to be enthusiastic about Jesus. And he welcomes it. But were they cheering for the right reasons? Because their messianic hero would bring a triumphant victory to Jerusalem. But Jesus comes for an entirely different reason. And we read of the heaviness of Jesus' spirit as he makes this final journey up to Jerusalem. As he reaches the top of the Mount of Olives and sees the city lying before him, he sheds tears, not so much for his own imminent rejection and suffering, but for the implications of the city's tragic unbelief and its coming decimation. The Jews found themselves under heavy Roman oppression. There were heavy taxes, restrictions, numerous executions by means of crucifixion. And Jesus knew about all these things. And he knew that they were in search of someone. They desired a king. They wanted a conqueror to set them free. They'd seen the mighty works of this man, Jesus. They were witnesses to what he had done. They saw him fed, feed the multitude with a little boy's lunch. They listened to him teach with authority. Surely with power and authority like that, Jesus was without a doubt the one who would set them free. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and the crowds cheered. And the timing was right too. It was approaching the Passover feast. That was symbolic of the event when the death angel passed over Egypt and Pharaoh let God's children go. And now, maybe just now, Jesus would be the one who would somehow lead them from the restraints and cruel treatment that they received from the Roman government. But Jesus would disappoint their expectations. 
Sometimes, perhaps, when things go our way, when God seems to do the things that we want, when Jesus rises to our cause, it's easy to, to cheer. But what about when that doesn't happen? What about when you face oppression and troubles? Too often, perhaps, the cheering stops. Words of adoration and praise quickly fade. In fact, we can become disillusioned and almost angry with God when he doesn't give us what we want. People want peace, freedom, deliverance, hope, someone to trust. And they miss it. They stumble over the one who can provide it. It's easy for us to just basically have as our prayers, Lord, deliver me, help me, fight for me, uplift me. Rather than, Lord, mould me, use me, grow me through these things, change me, get glory for yourself. In their desire to escape their immediate circumstances, to have their brand of peace, they missed the fact that they walked in the very presence of the Prince of Peace. <coughs> and that's the third thing that I want to say about Jesus this morning, is that he came on the greatest peace mission ever. Whenever a city was conquered in the ancient world, the type of animal the victorious king would rise as he entered a defeated town would make all the difference in the world to the people. If he was seated on a horse, the city was doomed. It was a sign that he'd come in war. But if he was riding a donkey, everyone would breathe a sigh of relief because it was a sign he was coming in peace. And Jesus came peace mission. Every time that his, uh, Jesus met the disciples after his resurrection, he said, Shalom, which is the Hebrew greeting, which means much more than peace as we understand it, but it means harmony with yourself, with other people, and with God. It means health, salvation, and victory. And that deep inner peace is available to each one of us. And it could be this morning that we've lost that sense of God's inner peace, of his presence. He comes to bring peace to you, to your life, to your circumstances right now. And the fourth thing is that Jesus came to replace religion. Towards the end of the Bible reading that Robin brought to us, we see how Jesus drove out the merchants and money changers in the temple complex. There are different versions of the events of Palm Sunday, depending which gospel you read, different things that are emphasized. There are some things in common, but some things that are emphasized in one, some things that are not emphasized or mentioned in another. But in Mark's gospel, sandwiched in between these events is another incident, sandwiched in between Jesus coming into Jerusalem and him driving out the money changers from the temple courts, where we read this in Mark 11, 12 to 14. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, 
May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now people are quite shocked by this action of Jesus. And try to explain this away because we live in a tree-hugging age, don't we? So um, sort of to curse a tree doesn't seem like a very good thing to do. But I, th I think there's a danger of us having too much sympathy for the tree. That's what I, I thought when I first read that. I thought, that's strange. Actually, there are things called taksh, the Jewish word taksh. Small edible growths on the Mediterranean fig tree that appear around March and which later drop off before the actual figs ripen. So presumably this tree had no tax and therefore wasn't going to have any fruit. So why did Jesus do this? Well, the fig tree was one of the national symbols of Israel. And as a fruit-bearing tree, the nation of Israel, despite their show of religion, despite the leaves on the tree, despite the tax, or lack of tax, or anything, despite the leaves on the tree, it was useless and would have to be replaced. So by cursing this one, Jesus presented to us a living parable. The fig tree that doesn't bear fruit is cursed. It's not cleansed or reformed. Where no fruit's found, destruction comes. The barren fig tree represents the barrenness of the temple. Judaism was not prepared to accept Jesus' messianic reign. And just as the tree gives the impression that it might have had something to eat, so the temple gives the impression that it's, it's dedicated to the service of God. And Jesus therefore graphically acts out God's rejection of the temple and its coming destruction. And so later when the disciples are awestruck by the size of the temple, Jesus tells them that not one stone will be left standing. The temple had been 46 years in the rebuilding, and yet in spite of its magnificence and splendor and all the money and skill that had been lavished on the temple, it was about to become irrelevant. Jesus' sacrifice would make the temple sacrificial system irrelevant. And so Jesus came to replace religion. Our contact with God, our entry into his presence, our approach to him is not about anything built by people or any system of belief devised by human <laughs> minds. Paul says, Do, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? You are the temple of God. He has chosen to reside in those who put their faith in him. You, your body, is meant to be a place of worship, a place of reverence and purity in which the Holy Spirit <coughs> of God resides. And with the same jealous love that Jesus clears the temple, Jesus wants to clear the things out of our lives that keep God from being revered rightly within us. He's passionate about residing in you. When, when he cleared the temple, it was a radical act of godly <clears throat> jealousy. And yet when he died on the cross, it was the most radical of all acts and a demonstration of his love for you. And he went to the cross to drive out all those other loves that keep you separated from God. Jesus welcomes exuberant praise. Sometimes Jesus doesn't fulfill our expectations. Jesus came on the greatest peace mission ever. And Jesus came to replace religion with a relationship 
with himself. Which of these aspects of Jesus do you most need to re-engage with today? Which of them has been neglected? You sometimes easily get caught in a wrong view, a misguided view of Jesus and his purpose. I guess the, the love and adoration that those crowds displayed towards Jesus riding into Jerusalem on that we celebrate on Palm Sunday is one kind of, of love. And perhaps we sometimes tend to practice that kind of Palm Sunday love. But with regard to the kind of Good Friday love that Jesus showed, the sacrificial, selfless love. Perhaps it's just something we admire. That we, we're good at loving when we're fulfilled and things are going well and Jesus is doing what we expect him to do. But Good Friday love is, is being willing to endure the wrongs of others. To put its own happiness in second place for the sake of someone else. In the same way that God never loves us for what he can get out of it. Jesus died to make you a place where the living God could dwell. And he wants to drive out all other loves <coughs> and self-serving agendas that keep your body from becoming a temple in which God can dwell. This story is a very fierce love. It's a jealous love. It's all about... Jesus' love for the Father and the things that were meant for the Father. And ultimately, that means it's about his love for you too. He's consumed with love for you. No wonder he, he cried as he approached Jerusalem. Because even those who were singing his praises did not really know who he was and what that meant. There's a new worship because of the risen body of Jesus. God's presence is no longer centered in a building, but in a human heart. And maybe he wants to change the areas of your, the courts of your inner heart that perhaps have become cluttered and compromised and corrupt in the same way as Jesus cleansed the temple. So that your heart might be a proper residence for him. Not by you and me making resolutions to be better people from now on. But rather to receive it as a gift. As we invite Jesus to live in us and continually transform us by his Holy Spirit. Let's spend a few moments now in prayer.